Andy Cole, Al Rotz, um, Chung Shin Lee, and Bill Salas. Um, first off, why do we need to estimate ammonia emissions from feed yards? Well, the beef feeding industry is highly concentrated spatially, with most of the feed yards located in Texas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Kansas. And it's pro been proposed that beef cattle are responsible for about 15% of anthropogenic ammonia production. Now, this emitted ammonia could impair air, soil, and water quality, and Rick did a good job of talking about how that could happen. And also, Rick and April both showed us that it is possible to directly measure these ammonia emissions on these feed yards. They also showed us that the ammonia emissions vary um, with temperature seasonally and also with crude protein concentration. So management plays a huge role in what was coming off of these feed yards. But direct manage, um, measurement is just not really practical. So we need some sort of tool that allows us to do inventory to assess the impact of beef production on the environment, do emissions reporting, um, develop reasonable regulatory policies, um, and also evaluate the effects of changing these management practices and changing climate on how that's going to affect ammonia emissions. Um, typically, as Rick mentioned, um, ammonia emissions in the United States are determined using constant emission factors. And these emission factors are pulled from the literature and they're based on studies that were conducted on farms that were assumed to be average. And um, while this may work in some instances, this won't work across the board because we know that ammonia emissions change. And they're also microbially driven. And so any factor that influences the microbial population in that manure pack is going to influence your ammonia emissions. So we have process-based models. And these are mechanistic models that um, they're based on what we know about a system and how the components of that system interact. They track these components, such as nitrogen and carbon, um, through biochemical processes, and such as decomposition, mass transfer, nitrification, fermentation. And these are all based on scientific knowledge, what we know about that system and classical principles of thermodynamics and reaction kinetics. And in spots where we don't quite know exactly how it works, there may be some empirical elements in these models as well. They tend to involve a lot of data input. They, they need a lot of specifics. But if you do it right, you can get them to simulate these processes under varying conditions. And one really good thing about it is as we learn more about these systems in the lab and in the field, these models can be improved. They can be built upon step by step by step until we get, get it working right for a particular system. Um, so some of the processes that are involved in ammonia emissions from the feedlot, um, basically it all starts out with the excretion of feces and urine on the feedlot pen surface. About 90% of the ammonia that's coming off of the feedlot is coming from urinary urea. And that can happen within 48 hours, you can get as much as 90% of that lost. And that is broken down by the urease enzyme into ammonium. We also get some decomposition of fecal nitrogenous compounds into ammonium, although that process is much, much slower. And so mostly we're interested in, in urine. And as Andy pointed out, this urine concentration, the urea, how much nitrogen you're feeding is directly, directly related to how much ammonia you're going to be getting off of that feedlot. And some of our studies in the lab have shown that overfeeding protein, you can get as much as 71% of the excreted nitrogen in the, in the urea. Um, so these process-based models track this fecal and urine nitrogen through these processes, such as ammonia dissociation into ammonium dissociation into ammonia, perhaps nitrification and denitrification, if the conditions are right, the diffusive mass transfer of aqueous ammonia from the manure itself to the manure surface, equilibrium uh, between aqueous ammonia and gaseous ammonia, and the convective mass transfer of gaseous ammonia into the free airstream. 
Now these are all driven by different environmental and management factors such as temperature, moisture, wind speed, pH and redox status, um, the size of the cattle, the quantity and composition of the manure, substrate concentration, housing type, ventilation, and how long before the manure is removed. So these computer-based simulation models, there's um, two right now. There's, there's probably more out there that I'm not aware of, but um, that are useful for whole farm simulations. Um, the first is called Manure DNDC, and this is a, a relatively new model. It is based on the very well-validated denitrification and decomposition model that's used for soil or DNDC. Um, it's a very complex biochemistry of the manure decomposition um, with a, a more simple animal module and where nutrient excretion is based solely on nitrogen intake and the urine and fecal proportions are, are considered to be 50-50. Another model is the Integrated Farm Systems Model, or IFSM. This was developed by ARS researchers. And the IFSM takes a, a more generalized approach to the decomposition of the manure, but they have a much more complex animal module that actually relies more on production status and um, digestibility of the feedstuffs. Both of these models have been evaluated for dairy and swine production, but not till now have they been evaluated for open lot feed yards, which are inherently more influenced by precipitation, wind speed, um, surface heating of the manure pack, and things of that sort. So our objectives were to evaluate these two models for predicting ammonia emissions from open lot feed yards. So we compared our model simulation emissions to two years of measurements taking at commercial feed yards in Deaf Smith County, Texas. And this is the same data that Rick just showed, so it, um, you should be pretty familiar with that. And just for a frame of reference, the Texas Panhandle is the number one beef producing region in the United States. And in 2007, there were more than half a million cattle on feed at any one time right here in Deaf Smith County. Um, the model input for these two models varied somewhat, but this is just some of the general model input. We needed daily climate data, such as temperature, precipitation, wind speed, specific animal characteristics. The two feed yards we're looking at are feed yard A and feed yard E, which differed in their population. Feed yard A had 12,684 head, feed yard E 19,620 head. And this is not across the year, this is just at any one time. Um, the feeding rate was assumed to be 10.5 kilograms of dry matter intake per day. Um, the dietary crude protein varied monthly, and it was determined by analyzing the feed bunk samples. And as Rick showed, feed yard A and feed yard E were pretty consistent in their crude protein levels until 2008 when they started feeding distillers grains, and that jumped up to over 18% crude protein. And also IFSM needed information on diet composition which was considered to be a corn-based, uh, high-concentrate, low-forage diet supplemented with soybean milk. Um, this is evaluation of the IFSN model. And what we've got are grams of ammonia per head per day um, at feed yard A and feed yard E. And our modeled are the lines going up and down and up and down. And the circles there are our actual observed emissions. And so we can see that. IFSM did a pretty darn good job tracking this and at both feed yards. Now, there were very few actual data points at feed yard E, so when we did the evaluations, we kind of stuck to 2008. Um, so our summer emissions, the model were 214 versus 194 that were observed. Winter, 78, 78, so pretty good. Um, and also, this model did a good job of picking up some points some individual data points. Like one, one good place to look is like right here, where the emissions were low. That was a period where it was particularly wet. And so when it's raining, ammonia emissions are reduced to almost nothing. And so it did a good job of picking that up. And then as the manure dried out, you get this flush right there. And so up to that point, we got it. But this was also the point where they were feeding as much as 18% crude protein. So, you know, we have these really high peaks, so it's, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. 
Um, the next model are the minority in DC. The output of this particular model is on an area basis. So that it's kilograms per hectare per day instead of kilograms or grams per head per day. And this model it was very similar. Um, it did tend to overpredict at feed yard A, or there was better agreement at feed yard E. Um, and we also had higher emissions in summer than in winter um, at both feed yards. So this is the statistics for all this. Um, we used regression and a suite of univariate um, difference measures. Um, and what we saw is the index of agreement indicated 71 to 81 percent agreement between model predictions and observations. The um, regression coefficient was higher for feed yard A than for feed yard E, likely because of the sparsity of the data during 2007, but still it was highly significant. So given that we have pretty big daily that variation in these emissions, we calculated per capita emissions for each month in 2008 at both feed yards, and this is grams per head per day. We had to convert the minority NDC data based on the feed yard area and the number of cattle for each month. Um, and, but there was, there was agreement for every month at feed yard A except for July and September, where minority and DC tended to overpredict, and in January, where they both tended to underpredict. And so this is what I'd really like to talk about. Both of these models do a much better job at predicting annual feed yard emissions than constant emission factors. So. Um, Based on the data we got from the models and from the observations, we calculated per capita emission rates for both of these feed yards. Um, observed at feed yard A was 61 kilograms per head per year. Feed yard E was 33 kilograms per head per year. And if we multiplied those out by the number of cattle at, during that measurement period, 774 milligrams per, per feed yard per year, or 639 megagrams per feed yard per year. Um, and so if we, the, from that we found that our model predictions were within 3 to 10 percent of our actual feed yard emissions, whereas this U.S. EPA emission factor, this is what's currently used, of 13 kilograms per head per year, underestimated ammonia emissions by 79 percent at feed yard A. Uh, it was very similar for feed yard E. You did see that the emissions were lower for that feed yard overall, but still the model predictions were 15 to 24 percent within the observations, whereas the EPA emission factor underestimated by 61 percent. So thus these models are, are clearly better than the current emission factors we're currently using. Um, and by incorporating more information about management and climate, then we can get a better handle on the impact of the beef production on the environment. So in conclusion, minority DNDC and IFSM predictions were within 71 to 81 percent agreement with the observations. Both models are sensitive to changes in temperature and dietary crude protein concentration. Both models can be used to quantify average per capita ammonia emissions for feed yards and are more accurate than constant emission factors. Is there potential for improvement? Yeah. I think that manure DNDC um, could be improved by adding more to their animal module to, to better estimate what's actually coming off when you increase the, the protein concentrations to get rid of that 50-50 assumption. Um, and also, I think a little bit more work on the effects of moisture content wind speed and surface heating on ammonia volatilization process would probably be useful as well. <laughs>